Um, all right. Well, thanks so much, everybody, for signing on. I know it is a busy time of the year. Everybody has a lot going on, so we really appreciate it. Um, for those of you that haven't met me yet, my name is Natalie Ryan. I'm the Long Island Community Partnership Manager for the Nature Conservancy. Um, fairly new, so I haven't met you all yet. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started and before we I introduce the speakers. Um, we're going to break up today's presentation into two parts. Um, we're going to start with the Diadromous Fish Restoration Strategy and River Revival Map, followed by the Atlas. Um, so please feel free, as um, Emily and Josh are speaking, to drop questions in the chat. I'll be monitoring them. Um, if you prefer to ask your question directly, no problem. Just indicate that in the chat as well. We'll have plenty of time for Q&A. Um, we are going to make the presentation and the recording available after the fact. So I will send that out to you guys early next week, um, if there's anything that you want to follow up on. Um, and then... I think that's that's all of our, our housekeeping. Um, so short introductions for our speakers today. I know a lot of you have collaborated with them in the past. Um, you're well aware of the amazing work that they do and probably know them very well. Um, so first up, we have Emily Hall. Uh, she is the Conservation Policy Advocate for SeaTuck Environmental Association. She's working to protect coastal landscapes and the communities that they inhabit. Um, and the communities that inhabit those landscapes. Um, she will be providing the overview for the Diadromous Fish Restoration Strategy and the River Revival Map. Um, following Emily's presentation, we have Josh LaFountain. He is a freshwater project coordinator for the Nature Conservancy. He is based out of our Keene Valley office, but he manages a statewide portfolio of projects. Um, he's going to be presenting on the Atlas, which is a road stream crossing prioritization tool. Um, so I think with no further ado, we can go ahead and dive into the program. Emily, thanks so much. I will get your slides up and running. All right. Thanks so much, Natalie. Um, so yeah, as Natalie mentioned, my name is Emily Hall. I'm a conservation policy advocate with SeaTuck Environmental Association. Um, and thank you so much um, for everyone joining us today. We're really excited to talk about a couple of these tools um, to help anyone, really, any type of practitioner, manager, just any interested party in restoring our Long Island rivers and streams. So I will be starting off with the Diadromous Fish Restoration Strategy. SeaTuck uh, took on this effort in 2018 with many, many great partners, um, environmental groups, state agencies, particularly from the Diadromous Fish Working Group uh, to prioritize the different rivers and streams on Long Island that are most in need of restoration. Okay, next slide, please. Just gonna close some things out. I'm not sure if I'm pausing or not. Okay, so next I wanted to show this digital elevation map. Um, we just think it's a great way to kind of start off talking about Long Island rivers and streams and kind of our, our restoration for diadromous fish. Um, so as you can see, kind of along the South Shore and East End a bit, you have a lot of these kind of like lighter areas. Um, so these are a lot of our coastal streams. Um, and basically, I might actually, I'm not sure if I'm pausing, I might stop my video just to um, make it a little easier for folks to hear me. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so here's our digital elevation model, as I mentioned. And basically this is just to show the really interesting glacial history of Long Island. Um, so as the glaciers pulled up and away from Long Island, they carved out these valleys, especially along the South shore that have now formed many of Long Island's kind of creeks and rivers. Next slide, please. Okay, if you could hit play as well. Just the next button. 
Okay, great. Um, so these remaining valleys left us with a legacy of these mostly small, shallow streams that are filled by cold groundwater and supplemented by surface runoff from storms. They're a really integral part of the amazingly rich and diverse terrestrial, estuarine, and marine ecosystem, and they support an abundance of wildlife. Next slide, please. Okay, so just to go over a little bit about some of the wildlife that we'll focus on um, that really call these uh, streams home are diadromous fish. So dia means through, dromus means running. So these are fish that migrate between salt and fresh water. Uh, can you, the next button please? Great. Um, so the first type of uh, diadromous fish we'll go over is river herring. So there's two different types of river herring. There's alewife and blueback herring. They are anadromous or uprunning. These are fish that spend most of their lives at sea and then migrate to the fresh water to breed or spawn. Next please. And then the other fish we'll talk about is American eel. These are catadromous, meaning down running. Uh, these fish spend most of their lives in fresh water and then migrate to the sea to breed or spawn. Next, please. And then also, we also uh, don't wanna leave out brook trout. Um, so these are semi-diadromous species. So they hatch and spend most of their lives in freshwater, but they can migrate into the estuaries uh, to forage for months at a time. So they don't have the kind of wide extent um, of migration like river herring or eels, but they do kind of transfer between multiple systems. Next, please. Okay, so kind of why are these different species important? What's their value to us? Um, so for one, they have a tremendous ecological importance. River herring and American eels tie our oceans and rivers together. They provide vital nutrients and forage needed to make healthy ecosystems. Pretty much as you can see here from all these pictures, everything eats them from out in the ocean, whales and dolphins. And then when they get into the estuaries, seals and coastal birds. And then when they get into the freshwater streams, you know, species like otters, raccoons, um, ospreys. So they really are a foundational part of the food chain. Next, please. All right, and then they also have a tremendous economic importance. So the predators of river herring and eels support um, a tremendous amount of fisheries, a seafood industry, ecotourism. There are many commercially and recreational valuable uh, fisheries that rely on forage fish like river herring. Um, and brook trout is also a very important um, sport fish. Next slide, please. So their historical importance. So river herring and American eel have supported communities for centuries. Uh, there is a saying that coastal streams used to run silver with the amount of river herring available in streams. Um, both of these sp species also played a really important role in indigenous America. As you can see in some of these pictures, you see native groups fishing, uh, Thanksgiving table with a bunch of eels on it. And even in colonial times, many new settlers relied on these fisheries as well. Um, so much so that new dams are actually very controversial um, in New America because they basically block these fisheries, uh, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Thank you. Um, so unfortunately, these fisheries are really, really hurting. They're dwindling over time because they're not able to get upstream into their freshwater habitat because they're blocked by these dams. So as you can see here in this kind of quote from NOAA Fisheries, unfortunately, river herring populations are at historical low as a consequence of dam construction, habitat loss, habitat degradation and overfishing. The reduction in spawning habitat by dams is the largest disturbance based on the estimated yearly loss of river herring. Um, so historically, dams were built for a number of reasons, um, whether to be ice ponds, um, whether to support mills or cranberry bogs, even on Long Island. However, a lot of these purposes are no longer needed. So we really, as part of this process, need to rethink the dams across on island and what they're doing ecologically um, to both the system as a whole and these particular diadromous fish species. Next slide, please. Okay, so there's various goals that are part of the diadromous fish restoration strategy. Um, this whole strategy is meant to be a roadmap to restore the diadromous fish habitat. So I'll go over each of these three goals. Next, please. 
The first goal is to increase the total size of the Long Island River herring run. Um, we're a little hard to know whether we're kind of on track for this goal. As you can see here, I kind of highlighted 2023 is kind of our next milestone. Um, it's interesting because monitoring efforts are a bit difficult. They can be costly. You have to run cameras. You need infrastructure, different things like that. So we've had a little bit of a hard time in some situations getting these systems running. So it's hard to exactly know what the run across Long Island is like. And we We've also learned from some recent really great research from Kelly McCartan and Peter Daniel um, from Suffolk Community College and Hofstra respectively, um, is that sometimes even these cameras, we're actually seeing fish pass them multiple times. So basically making multiple trips upstream. So in some efforts, um, before we found this out, we might've been counting fish more than once. So that might, might've also kind of messed with our estimate. Um, but just to give you kind of a rough understanding, the Peconic is estimated around 30,000 fish a year. Um, and that's one of our pretty much larger runs, that and Alewife, Alewife Creek um, out east as well. All right, next goal, please. So the next one is to discover more streams with remnant river herring runs. And remnant river herring runs just means that we found evidence of river herring in one of these streams. And that probably tells us there used to be a historically much larger run at this location. And thus, hopefully we can restore that. Um, we're definitely at our five-year goal. Um, there are already known of at least 30 streams with remnant runs and every couple of years or so, at least one or more is being discovered across the island. Um, we have a great volunteer program, our Long Island and River Herring, River Herring and Eel Survey, where basically a bunch of people go out to their local streams and they help us monitor. And this is really how we've been able to kind of track um, how many new streams we're kind of discovering um, that have River Herring. Next slide, please. And then the last goal is to increase the acreage of accessible spawning habitat. Um, so we're kind of almost close to our goal here. We have about 715 acres um, of restored spawning habitat as of 2022. Um, you might have seen in the news lately, there's a lot of great projects out there. There was a recent Newsday article that kind of highlights some of these projects, such as Woodhull Dam on the Peconic, uh, Mill River out in Rockville Center, Swan uh, Lake up in Patch, uh, down in Patchogue. Um, so there's a lot of really, really exciting projects that are taking place. Um, and these are restoring the much, much needed acreage of habitat for these diatomous fish species. Next slide, please. Okay, so how did um, the basically restoration strategy prioritized the different streams and barriers that were in most need of restoration. Um, so they did this based on a different um, set of characteristics. Next, please. One would be kind of an ecological parameter. Um, so whether there is presence of river herring, what is the number of that river herring run? Um, is there presence of brook trout? Is there presence of American eel? What is the historical presence of diatomous fish? So even if you're not necessarily observing diatomous fish at the stream, was there anecdotal evidence from the past that they were using that stream? And then also the potential suitability for diatomous fish. Would they use this stream? Does it have a freshwater source? things like that. Next, please. So the next parameter is connectivity. So what is this type of system? Uh, what is the total length or size of the stream? What are the acres of potential spawning habitat available if you restore connectivity? What are the number of migratory barriers? Is there only one dam? Is there multiple dams? Is there culvert issues? Um, and are there existing connectivity projects in place? So are is there already barriers that are being mitigated and you can build off that um, by trying to restore other barriers along the stream? Next, please. Uh, so the next one is functional network. So this is a combination of the tributaries upstream and downstream accessible habitat. So basically the distance of fish would theoretically swim um, if that barrier was removed and you kind of just measure the upstream length and the downstream length. Next, please. And then finally, habitat suitability. Um, so things like thermal barriers, this one in particular is really problematic uh, for brook trout. So brook trout really need that kind of cold, fresh, you know, river water. Um, but in these impoundments or ponds where there's dams, the water warms up really quickly and this becomes a thermal barrier to those fish. And then also overall water quality. Um, as they're moving into these freshwater streams and habitat, they're really looking for decent, good water quality in, in order to be able to spawn successfully. Some other things to note here, 
Um, oh, just going back one second. Sorry, thank you. Um, so it's just some other things to note here is that confirmed presence of river herring was given the most weight in this analysis. Um, also, if it was a first barrier on a stream, so basically, you know, the first barrier to the tidal connection, that was also given preference in this analysis. And then some other factors that were considered when making recommendations included the size of the dam, the historic nature of the dam, the community resource value, and how feasible, uh, feasible of a project would it be to restore that barrier or store connectivity. Next, please. Okay, so then we get to the recommendations. Um, so out of all the 13 towns, we came up with 35 priority projects. And this is basically how it's laid out in the restoration strategy. So you can see an, an example here from Islip. Um, you can see that we highlighted the town of Islip and we highlighted the different uh, restoration projects within that town. We give a little background on the particular river or stream that we're talking about. Um, so this one being the Connect Quad, it's a very, you know, renowned Long Island tributary, tributary has a really interesting history, um, especially for recreational use over the years. Um, and then we give our recommendations. So this one in particular, we want to assess potential for fish passage at the park's main pond, as well as the barriers on the side branches. Um, and then also we say um, to manage the stocking program to ensure it's compatible with efforts to restore population of native migratory fish. So in these recommendations, we're looking to do a number of things based on the unique scenario of that stream or that barrier. So sometimes we could say we want to assess fish passage. Sometimes we want to say we want to look at dam removal here um, or culvert resizing or other restoration efforts that we think would be beneficial at this particular project site. So we lay that out for each priority priority project um, in each of the towns. Next slide, please. So we put all of this into a river revival map. So this is basically the living version of the Diadromous Fish Restoration Strategy. We're constantly updating this map um, with new information where we find new remnant runs, um, where new projects are in progress, whether the projects have been completed. Um, so basically you could walk through this map on our website. You see a couple of the links there and we can also include them in the follow-up email. So if you just go to our website, ctech.org slash river revival or this ArcGIS map, um, you can basically walk through this all below, but I'll also lay it out in a couple of the next slides. Next slide, please. Um, so hopefully you can see this. I think it got a little squished, but um, here's our river revival map legend. So just walking through what some of these identifying um, basically keys are. So wherever there's a star, there's a priority stream connectivity project. So this is basically one of the projects that we laid out in the Diadromous Fish Restoration Strategy as one that we think um, is a priority for connectivity to be restored. The next one we have kind of a little sign in a tree um, that actually focuses more on stream kind of restoration in terms of like restoring stream banks, um, planting natives, taking out invasive species. So it's kind of some other stream restoration strategies to improve the habitat around that stream. Um, the little red um, dot there, a little red kind of pointer would be um, dams that are in the New York State Dam inventory. Um, kind of not all the dams on Long Island are within this inventory, but it really gives you a good idea of what the dams are and kind of gives you a little bit history of those dams and a background on them. Uh, the little fish icon is the presence of a rim, river uh, remnant, remnant river herring run at that stream. Um, when a stream is labeled as green, um, this is basically means that diadromous fish can't access that portion of the stream. When it's red, it means that fish cannot access that portion of the stream, either because of a barrier or some sort of blockage. And then when it's blue, it means that we've restored access to that portion of the stream through one of these type of connectivity projects. Next slide, please. So here is just a basic example of kind of what one of those projects looks like. So when you kind of zoom into the map, um, you'll see all the different rivers and streams here. You can see right here, we're on Argyle Lake on the Carls River. You see that there's a little yellow star there and there's also kind of that red pointer dot. Um, so that red dot means that there's the New York State uh, identifies that there's a dam there, the yellow, star means it's one of our priority projects. So I just click basically on that priority project and a little pop-up will pop up to the side of your screen if you're kind of 
um, on the map. And it'll basically give you an overview of the project. So what's the barrier name? What's the stream name? A little bit of background on the project. So this particular project had a um, Daniil style fishway installed in April of 2013. Um, it's still there. It's doing really well. And then access restored as well. So we restored appro approximately a mile of upstream habitat at this location. All right, next slide, please. And then we included a picture of that as well. So in many of these different restoration projects, you can go to, like I said, to that ye little yellow star and just click on it, get the whole background of the project and a picture as well as that project is completed. Next slide, please. Okay, so now, what are some of the connectivity strategies? What do we want to do after we kind of have a priority um, project in place? We know that there's a dam or there's a barrier and there's an issue. Um, there's a number of different ways to try and restore connectivity for diadromous fish. Um, these include just a little bit of a basic overview, technical, um, which is kind of like one of those like metal structures that you saw at Argyle's Lake. Um, basically some type of material or kind of a ladder which allows the fish to move up and over stream. Also nature-like, so trying to restore it to the most kind of natural-like system and then dam removal or lowering. Um, so I'll get in these a little bit more in the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so again, technical fish passage. This is a sort of like that metal box type of structure and it might have baffles or some other type of alteration that allows fish to move up and over a dam. Next, please. Some of the advantages of this option is that can, they can be really cost effective. Um, sometimes they become, they come prefabricated um, or they can be very um, relatively simple to kind of make and install. Um, another advantage is they will maintain the extent of the impoundment. So if for some reason you did not want to get rid of the pond, it would keep the pond in place. Another advantage is then for the most part, it can often fit into the existing extent of the spillway. So you don't necessarily need to um, dig into the earthen dam on either side or um, kind of move a bunch of things or do a whole bunch of construction in order to put this ladder in place. Next, please. Some of the challenges um, of these passes, though, are that they only pass river herring, unless it can be modified to also pass eels, but, but for the most part, the way that they're structured, they only pass river herring. Um, they, will, they will not reduce aquatic invasives. So a lot of times the ponds around Long Island will have a lot of difficulty with aquatic invasives or other aquatic plants they will basically just choke out a pond. Um, they will also not help with impoundment sedimentation. So oftentimes when you have an impoundment or a dam, um, all that sediment coming from downstream just gets stuck in the pond. Um, and this will basically fill in the pond until you go in and you dredge it, which can be really expensive. Um, it'll also keep the warm water temperatures of the impoundment. As I mentioned, that would be a big barrier to brook trout um, and some other species. And it would keep the maintenance and costs of the spillway. So kind of if you have the spillway or dam, they are often very old um, around Long Island. Many of them are more than 50 years old. Um, so they definitely deteriorate over time. And you keep that cost in place as well as some of the other costs I mentioned, such as dredging the pond or having to remove the aquatic invasives, which can also uh, be pretty costly. Next, please. So some of the local examples of where these have been implemented, um, the top picture there is up at Hards Lake um, on the Carmen's River. Um, the middle one there is a ladder at Massapequa Lake on the Massapequa Creek. And then the last one here is a brand new one um, at Mill River at Smith Pond. So that's kind of, that's um, definitely a new and exciting project on that one. Next, please. So nature-like fish passage. Um, these can also take a number of different forms, but basically it's a structure that more mimics a natural stream or its features, um, and sometimes can just include like step holes as well. All right, next please. So some of the advantages. So this will actually allow passage of other riverine species in addition to river herring. So like American eels, otters, et cetera. Um, there's that really interesting news story that came out recently of the seal that kind of followed the ladder and followed the river herring up into um, Grangeville Park. Um, so definitely other species can use these type of structures. Uh, they will still keep the extent of the impoundment. Um, so you don't necessarily have to lose the pond or the impoundment if you install one of these. Um, and they can often be a very aesthetically pleasing op option. You know, you're mimicking a natural stream system. Um, people, I think, find it really pleasing uh, to look at. Next, please. 
So some of the challenges, this can uh, be a very high, highly cost costly option. <laughs> um, this can take a lot of kind of construction and engineering around the site. Um, so it can definitely be a higher cost um, of the three different options I'll talk about. Um, again, because it's not getting rid of the impoundment, you will not necessarily be able to reduce those aquatic invasives. Um, you will also, again, not help with impoundment sedimentation. You will still keep those warm water temperatures in the impoundment. And lastly, again, you will keep that maintenance cost of either uh, repairing the spillway or the dam over time um, and the impoundment if you have to continue to judge it. Next, please. So some local examples, as I mentioned, the top one is from Grangible Park on the Beconic River. And then the next one, again, is a new one, Swan Lake um, on in Patchog. And this one, we also um, just saw evidence of an alewife actually above this um, dam. So basically, they used this fish passage already, um, which is really exciting. So really excited to see that one um, in place. Next, please. So now finally dam removal, or I should mention, um, like I said before, dam lowering. Um, so this is basically removing um, a portion of the barrier or the entirety of the barrier um, to basically open it up to be free flowing access for the stream. Next, please. So some of the advantages. This allows for free passage for all riverine species. So not just diatomous fish, but anything aquatic, insects, uh, river otters, um, really any species will now have access to this uh, free flowing stream system. Um, also, there could be a potentially rare and native seed bank um, below the pond level. So a lot of these dams, like I said, are very old um, and they could have been there for 50, 100 years or so. So they might have all these kind of rare and native seeds just sitting below the surface, kind of waiting for their chance to grow. Uh, you get rid of your aquatic invasives or aquatic plant problem um, because there will be no impoundment or dam. Basically, these will go away. Uh, you'll have reduced costs from having to maintain the spillway structure and impoundment over time. So you ne won't necessarily have to dredge if you just let it go in, uh, to be a free flowing stream. And you won't necessarily have to maintain the extent of the um, dam or spillway because you're removing it. Um, this can be a lower cost op option for implementation um, if it's a relatively simple project and you just have to remove the dam. I'll talk um, about in the challenges why it could also be a little bit higher cost, um, but I'll get that, into that in a second. Um, this will also allow for cooler water species like brook trout, so you won't have that kind of temperature um, problem. And then also this can help with climate resiliency. So in terms of flooding or storm, storm surge, um, these kind of open basins now can act as um, just like giant bowls to just fill in with those um, extra waters that as we know, will just get worse over time um, and can definitely be a benefit to the community. So you won't be flooding surrounding property. Next, please. So some of the challenges. Um, so you may have to manage for other invasives like Phragmites. So if you open up a system like this, um, some kind of invasives that are just being kept to the edge of the pond may try to sort of infiltrate into the new open habitat. So you may have to manage for those species. Also, you can have higher costs with this option depending on the nature of the sediment behind the dam or spillway. Um, so you don't necessarily want to just release all the sediment downstream so you have to be able to manage that and if the sediment contains some sort of pollution or other um you know factors like that then you have to remove of it in certain ways that can also be costly and overall a community may be very wary about losing their pond um they hold kind of i think a lot of um, sentimental value um so people might be wary of that next please so a local example, um, there actually has not been an intentional dam removal on Long Island, um, but there has been some dam failures. So this picture right here is, is an example of that. So this is Westbrook. Um, it's actually along kind of that Connectquat River stem. 
Um, and this dam failed in 2019 um, from kind of an intense um, summer storm. And basically all of these plants, like I was talking about that native seed bank just came up here. And this is only a few months, I believe this is August after that dam failed. So it didn't necessarily stay as like a um, kind of a dirty mud flat for very long. Um, and now it's really built up into this beautiful, um, rare kind of riverine marsh um, ecosystem, and we are currently managing the invasive frag here. Um, so I think that is my last slide for this section. Um, definitely there's pros and cons to each of these, and I believe I'll pass it over uh, to Josh to talk about the atlas. Yeah, thank you so much, Emily. Um, before we get started with Josh, I just wanted to take a quick break and see if anybody had any questions. Again, please feel free to put them in the chat while the presenter is speaking. Um, or if you want to go ahead and unmute, we have some time built in for questions. Yeah, I, I have a question. Sure. It's Doug Dalgard. Uh, none of the photographs that I've seen so far look like what I have up at Stony Brook Harbor uh, on the North Shore that runs into a tidal marsh that's owned by Suffolk County. It goes through a culvert that goes under our road. Um, the, the tidal marsh is probably four acres of solid Phragmites, and the face of the tidal marsh has not weed growing on it. Uh, we don't have any fish. I think the environment has been destroyed. I can't really get the county to do much. I'd like somebody to come and take a look. Maybe the culvert needs to be resized. That's a possibility. But I think a lot more than that needs to be done to this to restore this environment. I really have a problem here. I don't have the resources with which to do it. This is a small residential village called Head of the Harbor, but we have a lot of responsibility because we have two miles of shoreline on Stony Brook Harbor, which as you know, is a pocket bay and, and it's subject to uh, erosion runoff from the moraine. Uh, so I, I, I'd like to get one of those yellow stars on my <laughs> project here, if yes. that's possible. Yeah, well, well, thank you. Um Hi, Emily. Mentioning that. Yeah. So um, that actually is probably going to be discussed more by Josh. He can probably um, describe a little bit more in his presentation, kind of some of the parameters around uh, culvert prioritization, um, even in tidal areas as well, um, and some of the recommendations around ways to fix that. Um, like I said, mostly our map really focuses on dams or spillways. And then we kind of have this separate map, which Ash will talk about, the Atlas, uh, which really focuses more on those culverts. All right, I'll wait till Josh gives his presentation. <laughs> Any other questions for Emily before we, we move forward here? No. All right. Well, if anything comes up, feel free to put it in the chat or after Josh, you know, we can always go back to Emily as well. Um, so Josh, you're up next. I will go ahead and get your slides on the screen. I'll probably stay off camera as well. I've been having some issues today. Um, but uh, yeah, to, to answer your question, um, we, we can talk more about it. Um, there's a link to the tool, uh, so you can zoom in and look at that, that particular crossing uh, that, that you were talking about in the in the tool itself. Uh, but if you are interested in talking more in more depth, we can we can definitely do that and set up a time. Um, so I'm going to be covering today um, the atlas, as, as Natalie mentioned, uh, which is a, a non-title and title. Um, barrier, road stream crossing barrier assessment tool. Um, so uh, essentially uh, we've gone through uh, a good portion of Suffolk County um, and, and done some field assessments, some desktop analysis, um, and then sort of developed a scoring criteria uh, that put together um, several different categories, which I'll go over today, um, and then sort of map those all out spatially and then sort of comparatively um, in, into a prioritization. Uh, and as you can see, um, the title slide is a little bit out of date, but um, I have, there's a lot of slides here today uh, that I have to get that I'll be that I'll be throwing at you. Um, so as Natalie mentioned, this is all going to be sent to you afterwards. So I wanted to keep the slides in there um, 
just so that when you're navigating around the tool or using the tool afterwards, all that information is in here um, and you can use it and it'll still be useful to you. Uh, but if you have questions or if it sounds like I'm going too fast or throwing too much at you at once, uh, feel free to hold your questions or put them in the chat and I'll try to get to them at the end. Um, so a little bit of a background on, on the tool itself. Um, so we started sort of with with some spatial questioning and where where these culverts are, uh, where these road stream crossings are, um, and then where the potential problem areas are across Suffolk County. Uh, so that was sort of the basis of it. Um, and then the next step is is then to take it into field assessment. So so for the, the freshwater um, assessments, we use the, the NAC protocols, which is for those of you that aren't familiar, it's sort of a broad 13 state region. They're the generally accepted protocols that are used um, across those regions for uh, getting an aquatic barrier score as well as some other some other scores. Um, and then we use the New Hampshire protocols uh, for the for the tidal crossing assessments. Um, once we once we gathered all of those assess all that assessment data, uh, we then put it into sort of a, a desktop analysis to do some further assessment on tidal, and then um, did did some prioritization or developed that, that prioritization criteria, um, which then eventually led into the tool. Um, and actually, at this point, that that last box there can be checked. So the final tool is now available. I don't know, and I have a link in the next slide. Uh, for you, as well as the report, or I guess this is a slide after this. Um, so an overview of the county itself, um, we identified there's about 709 crossings that are mapped in Suffolk County. Um, generally, and in our experience, that's probably anywhere between 80 to 95 percent of, of what's actually there. There's a lot that sometimes isn't identified um, through through aerial or through desktop analysis. Um, and, and just so um, and just to clarify, these are either stream or tidal crossing. So we're not looking at any sort of storm, stormwater drainage or any roadside drainage. Those type of culverts are not included in this tool. Um, of, the, of the 700 or so, um, we, we assessed, fully assessed just under 400. Um, and the reason being for that is these, these assessments are a quite time assessments or quite, quite time, uh, well, they, they take a lot of time, I guess I could say. Um, so, so we couldn't effectively get to all of them and develop this tool within the time time frame that we had allotted. Um, so we we prioritized a number or a number of crossings based on um, some of the criteria I'll talk about. Uh, got got to about 400 of them, um, and then many of these crossings as well that we weren't able to were private crossings. Um, but we are available um, to to do more assessments uh, in this area. Next slide, please. Um, so, so um, I mentioned that we sort of went through this, the assessment of the field process and then the, the develop some criteria. So these next few slides, um, I might throw, might go through them fairly quickly, but this is sort of how we got to the, the prioritization scores at the final prioritization score. Uh, next slide. Uh, and generally we had four major brackets of scoring or four major metrics. Um, ecological benefit, resilience benefit, uh, transportation, and condition. Um, and so these these were compared somewhat differently between freshwater, the, the freshwater protocol, and then the non-tidal. So for ecological resilience and condition, um, they were similar but somewhat different scoring that, that factored in. And overall, there's the score is out of 20. So if a, if a project scores at a 20 out of 20, that means it's the highest priority. Um, and then on down to, to four is the lowest score that we received for a crossing. Next slide. Um, so further breaking down some of these, these brackets into some submetrics that we looked at. The ecological benefit was primarily um, looking at aquatic connectivity. Um, so AOP is the term that that is often thrown around for that. Um, so that was sort of the primary metric of scoring and you get that through both the New Hampshire assessment protocol for tidal and then the NAC protocols for, for non-tidal. Um, and then we also had river size was a, was a factor and then sort of that the functionally connected network is what is what we, we call it, um, which is basically uh, if you're looking at any point, how, how far up or downstream is the next barrier? So looking at the total number of river miles up and downstream um, to, the, to the next barrier. Next slide. 
Uh, and then the resilience benefit, we actually um, used the Cornell Quav or the, the Cornell culvert capacity model, um, which is a, a model that was developed by the by the Cornell uh, by Cornell University to look at at what point um, would a culvert uh, with with storm volumes does it start to overtop the culvert and then overtop the road. Um, so we we use that as sort of our uh, basis for resilience scoring. Um, and looking at some of the inundation on either the road, the culvert, and then looking at the, the risk at the, uh, for the, at the watershed level. Next slide. Uh, transportation, there is really two, um, two brackets here. Um, the first being the road functional class. So what, what level of road are we talking about here? Uh, so dirt roads or uh, low traffic roads scored lower and then on up to the high traffic roads and to, to uh, more highway type roads toward higher. Uh, and then the second one is, oh, sorry. The second one is, is evacuation routes. So that, that factors into a lot of what, a lot of what we, we uh, did for this sort of transportation benefit. Um, and the reason we wanted to include that is because, uh, especially during natural disasters, if you have, if you have any sort of uh, road stream crossing loss or you have that loss of, of road connection, um, you have to then develop other routes, um, and that could potentially cut off EMS or, or others or other response vehicles from being able to access their, the point that they need. Next slide. Um, and then the last bracket was was the infrastructure benefit. Um, again, there's there's two um, two criteria here: uh, the structural condition, which was assessed during the the field assessments um, for using both protocols, and then we also included partner priorities. So we went. Uh, one of the at the start of developing this tool, we went around to many of the, the municipalities and, and even the county and looked at what their priority lists were and tried to overlay them so that they factored in because ultimately this tool is going to be hopefully for municipalities and for for partners to use. So we wanted to make sure that that the their priorities factored in. Next slide. Um, so when you look at this is what. Uh, a cumulative example of a score looks like, um, and, and I'll show you how to sort of navigate through the tool to get to this point. Um, but this is at a single crossing, um, and it sort of gives you the breakdown of all of the four brackets of scoring. And then on the right side, you can see um, the total prioritization score. So it, it gives you each of the four brackets, what that score was. Remember that's out of between one to five, and then the, the total score is between four and 20. Um, and this one is a 13. Uh, so that's actually um, and I'll show you the brackets later. That's um, that's fairly high on the scoring list. We we ended up tiering them um, to sort of further break it down between low priority, mid priority, high priority, and highest priority. Um, so this one would be in a high priority. Um, and actually, uh, it's the way we scored it is we wanted to have the best resolution possible. So it's I don't believe there are any that actually scored a 20 out of 20. There's maybe one or two that got 19s or 18s, um, and then and then on down from there. So so the resolution is sort of spread out to where um, a 13, even though it's not a 13 out of 20 is still a pretty high priority. Next slide. Um, so this is where we're gonna start getting into the, the tool itself. Um, so many of these slides are, are gonna be here for your reference for afterwards. Um, and at the bottom of this slide, you can see uh, the link to the tool is right there. Um, and if you need it, also we can, we can send it to you as well. Um, but for those of you that have used or navigated around RTS online, uh, this tool navigates very similarly to that. Um, so, so if you've used the DEC's environmental resource mapper or any of those or FEMA flood mappers, um, it all navigates pretty similarly. Next slide. Um, so when you open the tool, this is sort of um, what it brings you to. I mentioned the, the sort of brackets, um, the, the priorities. So on the top right in the legend, you can see um, for both title and non-title, there are sort of brackets that it, that it goes through. Um, and then next slide. Um, so there's a there's other stuff that that we wanted to include with along with the prioritization itself um, to be able to give this the sense of the most useful possible tool we could create. Um, so we, we put a lot of information in there that might be helpful to some, but not all partners. Um, and this. This slide is just, once you open the tool, this will pop up, give you some background. Um, and essentially you just have to click the, that splash screen and okay, so next slide. And then we'll bring you to um, 
this map right here, uh, which is sort of the overview of the county uh, and then the overview of both title and non title uh, with freshwater benefits. Um, and then that, that scoring. So, as, as I mentioned, um, 12 to 13 is still high, 14 and plus is the highest. Um, and then it goes on down from there. And then under seven is, is low. Um, and you can still see uh, there's several that are in gray. Those are the non scored ones. So, as I mentioned earlier, um, there's probably uh, a little over 250 plus. Uh, crossings that we did not assess for a number of reasons. Um, those are still there, uh, so you can get some some basic information if you click on those ones in gray as well. Next slide. Um, so there's there's a few things. This slide really shows you how to navigate the tool. Um, there's a few things that I want to point out. On the top right, um, you can you can look at the the layer list. Um, so you can sort of turn on and off the layers that that you're most interested in. Uh, which we'll get into in a little bit, but there's also charts and graphs available um, based on how you how you filter the data that you're looking at, um, and it'll it'll bring up uh, several graphs that are that give you visual representation on number of priorities or highest priorities or barriers or a connected network or whatever you're searching for. Um, you you should be able to get um, some visual representation that might help you uh, either in in permitting funding applications, planning or presenting to town boards that type of thing. Um, and on top left, uh, there's there's a few things I wanted to point out as well. The search bar is probably, if you have a, a crossing in mind, that search bar is, is the easiest thing to use. Um, you can put your, the coordinates in or even the road address and it'll bring you to to there, to the, to the crossing. Um, and you can sort of navigate that around that way quickly rather than trying to zoom in and find the right one. Um, and then in the, just below that, you'll see that the funnel shaped looking thing, um, that's the filter tool. Um, and, and I'll show you in the slides down below, but um, that, that'll help you filter out to really get to drill down to what you're most interested in. Um, and if anyone's interested most more in the, the scoring breakdowns um, and the actual scores that went into everything, uh, if you see down at the bottom, there's sort of that tab in the center, uh, you can drag that up and that brings up the attribute table. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. For um, so I, I mentioned that there's the, the layer list um, and there's several things that you can sort of turn on and off in the layer list. So Natalie, if you want to click to the next slide. Um, one, of the, one of the nice things about uh, this tool and sort of how, it's, how it was set up is you can also search through the, through the tool for the specific benefit that you're looking for um, and not, not the overall score. So, so this is showing the ecological, ecological benefits only um, from one to five. And, and sort of tiering it that way rather than encompassing all the scores. So if you're looking at this from a watershed uh, perspective or only look, wanting to look at what's, what's the highest for um, aquatic organism passage or an ecological score, uh, you can search by specifically ecologically and get, get to possibly a different crossing through that, through that approach. Next slide. Uh, similarly with, with resilience. Um, so if you're most, most interested in, in flooding, uh, or flood uh, capacity problems with, with crossings. Um, you can search specifically for resilience. Um, and then you can sort of skip through the next two slides because it's uh, both, both infrastructure and transportation. You can, you can break it down that way as well. Um, and I mentioned that this tool is, uh, we, we want this tool to be sort of a, a one-stop shop for a lot of different things. Um, so that we wanted to include several layers that are hopefully useful. Um, to, to some portions of, of our partners uh, that they can then use in conjunction with the prioritization scores itself. So um, there's several layers, town boundaries. Maybe we can skip their next slide. Um, these are the evacuation routes. So this was factored into the scoring, as I mentioned, uh, but you can also overlay it to look at where they are on the, on the uh, evacuation routes. And if you were particularly interested in one route and Particularly, you can look at several crossings across an evacuation route. Next slide. Uh, railroads, similarly, as well as a layer that's included. Next slide. Um, this is looking at the, the estuaries um, that, that are on Long, on Long Island. So separating them out that way looking it allows you to sort of look at that watershed approach as well, um, just in a different viewing method. Next slide. 
Um, and then there, there's some other sort of, I guess there's there sort of like tertiary um, data points that, that might be useful, especially when we're talking about um, funding sources or specific funding sources or uh, permit applications. Um, this one here is the impaired water bodies list or priority water bodies list. Um, so you can look at how the, how the crossings and the prioritization stack up against priority water bodies. Next slide. Um, here are some, some tidal wetlands. Uh, so looking at the tidal wetlands um, and then how those interact with some of the tidal crossings or even the freshwater crossings um, that, that are, exist in the tool. Next slide. Um, and then this is sort of the, the cumulative look at all of the wetlands uh, that are identified on Long Island. Next slide. Um, there's also some, some other uh, categories in here. So this one is the impervious surface um, mapper. So it looks at the, the percent of impervious surface that exists sort of across Long Island. So um, sort of follows what you might expect with, with sort of the urban areas and then some of the, the less developed areas. Um, so looking at that might be influential in this sort of figuring how to prioritize um, some of these replacements. Next slide. Um, and then this is sort of looking at, at coastal flooding. Um, so it, it goes through the amount of um, frequency of flooding or potential frequency of flooding on Long Island. Um, and sort of, you can look at where these crossings are. Some of these are within the areas that flood frequently. Um, so that's another way of looking at it. This was all factored into the score, but these are ways to help you sort of look at it visually as well. Next slide. Uh, you can skip that one. Um, and then this is just land use. So similar to the impervious surface, if you're interested in looking at the land use of a, a, an estuary or watershed, um, you can sort of break it down through through this visual uh, representation as well. Next slide. Um, now I'll sort of go through some of the search functions. So as I mentioned, if you've used any of the any of the mappers before, this is probably all fairly basic knowledge, um, but I'll, I'll go through some of the more important areas about navigating this tool. Next slide. Uh, so I mentioned the top left, there's several ways you can filter this map uh, when you're looking at the crossing. Um, so you can map, you can um, look at the, as I mentioned, you can look at either the scores separately, but ecological uh, transportation uh, and all those other brackets. Next slide. But you can also search by, uh, municipality, uh, estuary, or even road jurisdiction as well. So um, for, for municipalities, if you're working within a, a specific town, um, you can filter out everything else that, that's sort of outside of that township. Um, and then you could even break it down by road jurisdiction afterwards. So if you go by town and then by town on road, um, you can look at what, what specific crossings are uh, at play with what you're considering. Next slide. I right, skip that one. Um, and then there's there's other ways to sort of try to get an area that you're interested in. If there's a specific park or specific uh, block of roads that you're interested, you could use the select function, um, draw in there, draw, draw boundaries um, for what you're looking at. Um, and then sort of that'll update the, the list and be able to update some of those visual metrics as well. Next slide. Um, one of the things that, that you can also look at, um, you can sort of compare some of the, the statistics across uh, crossings um, by right clicking on the, the selection layer that, that pops up after you select it, um, and then going down to statistics, uh, you can do that. You can also create a layer um, that will allow that layer to sort of remain with, with those areas selected. And then the, the attributes table, there's another way to access it through here too. Next slide. Uh, you can skip that one. Um, so, so I mentioned that there, there are some charts um, that, that you can sort of have some visual representations that might be interest that might be interesting for, for a number of reasons. Um, but yeah, you know, here's a, here's just sort of an example of one of the ways you can look at um, the number of crossings that that exist and what priority brackets are in. So this is looking at a distribution of of the the crossings. Um, I believe this one's across the pole assessment list for freshwater protocol. Next slide. Um, you can skip that one. Next slide. Um, so here is similar, um, looking at some of the, 
the, the prioritization scores, um, so more region specific. Next slide. Um, so eventually, um, if you get to the point where you're looking at one, one single crossing um, and, or you're at a crossing, um, and you can see here in the top left, uh, they search by crossing code. Uh, that little blue dot there is, is the crossing that was identified. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, and what happens when you when you get to that point? There's a pop up that opens, um, and it gives you some of the the more pertinent information. So it gives you the road name, uh, road jurisdiction, what township is it in, um, an estuary as well. Uh, if there's a stream name, it'll it'll uh, give you that as well, and then it gives you sort of that that breakdown scoring for for the crossing. Uh, next slide. Uh, and at the bottom, there's a, a PDF that brings you to the scoring sheet, or it brings you to the NAC data. So if you Click the next slide. Uh, and this is what the scoring sheet ultimately looks like. So I showed you sort of what that summary looked like. Um, this is what the, the PDF looks like um, with, with a lot of the background of, of the tool itself um, and how things were collected, but also some of the scoring background. Um, and if you look sort of at um, the NAC crossing code, it's, there's a blue link there. Um, that'll bring you to the, the NAC data. So if you wanna click the next slide. Um, oh, okay, so never mind. So this is just that second page of the tool. Um, here you can sort of get pictures to get a better idea of what you're looking at. So you don't actually have to go out to the site to get a get an idea of what you're looking at for this. Um, and then there's there's NAC data as well. So everything that was collected, um, at least for the freshwater protocol, um, or all that information that was collected about. Uh, crossing size, structure type, structure condition, condition, that's all accessible through this link as well. Next slide. Uh, so I've been, I've mentioned that uh, we wanted this to be uh, a tool that's, that's useful for a number of different uh, partners uh, across Long Island or across Suffolk County. Um, and so there's, there's several things that can be done with this tool. Um, the first and most obvious is that it's, it's a it's a planning tool. Um, so planning at municipal, regional, watershed, or estuary levels, um, you can sort of compare across the watershed or estuary or spatially across uh, you know, a jurisdictional boundary. Um, it can be used for long-term planning to help incorporate into either road repair schedules or crossing repair schedules, um, but it can also be done for site-specific planning. Uh, so there's a lot of information, uh, specifically when you get to that, that PDF that I just showed you there. There's a lot of useful information that can be um, sort of taken right from the desktop and you don't actually have to go out into the field to get a lot of this information because it's already available. Um, and then there's, oh, go back, sorry. Um, there's also a few other avenues that, that hopefully this tool can, can be of use um, in, in funding applications. Um, a lot of times now next surveys or something similar to a next survey is, is required. Um, not, not so much for title yet, uh, but that's coming down the pike, I believe. Um, but for, for the freshwater protocols, a lot of times a NAC or similar survey is required. So you can, if it's already done, you can just flag it um, through this tool. Uh, there's also potential for being able to get additional credits by, by calling this out as a regional priority on a, on a regional list or regional tool. Um, so there's, there's ways to sort of increase credit um, or increase points towards better getting uh, funding sources. Um, and then the last is in, in permit applications. So I've used this, this tool uh, a number of times to help with, with permit applications just because the, the amount of information that you need on the, on the permit application, much of it, it can be found through this tool. Next slide. Um, and then so uh, just sort of taking a look broader, uh, once you've sort of gone through this process and you have a crossing in mind, um, looking at what are the best practices for replacing cross crossings. Um, so these are, these are general guidelines that, that are mostly accepted um, that go above and beyond requirements that are typically either um, state DOT requirements or even municipal, um, sometimes other typical requirements. And these are generally above and beyond that try to consider uh, the best possible design for enc encompassing storm flows, flood flows, um, as well as organism passage. Um, so for, for non-tidal crossings, um, 
they're generally uh, somewhat somewhat simpler to design um, when compared to tile. Um, you have to only consider that unidirectional flow um, and generally flow that's that storm storm flow volumes, so 100 year storm event and then aquatic organism passage. So the general recommendations and the, the ones that we, we tend to operate on when we do replacements um, is that the structure spans at least 1.25 times bank pull width. Um, and that's, and for, for anyone who's, who doesn't know sort of, or isn't familiar with what bank pull width is, that's sort of the, the top point of the channel where the, the stream, when it reaches that point, it'll then start spilling out into the floodplains um, if, they're, if it's connected to a split plane. So um, we generally try to go 1.25 to encompass the flood flows as well. Um, we also try to keep the volumes at a 100 year storm event um, where, the, where the crossing is only at 80% 80, 80 capacity. So if there's a 100, 100 year storm flood um, that's passing through the stream, um, there's still 20% capacity above uh, that in the in sort of volume of the structure. Um, and open bottom structure is preferred for both um, where possible uh, and the substrate should match the stream. Um, Tidal is somewhat more, more complicated in design. Um, it, it tends to take more of a individual approach to trying to design and size um, and identify structures uh, needed for, for tidal crossings. Um, so that generally has, has more engineering and more hydrologic study involved. And then I think that's right. That's when we're going to shift over, right, Natalie? Uh, yes. Yeah. So before we get to your questions, Josh, um, Emily just has one slide to talk about Nassau County. I see that we already have a question about that in the chat. Um, so Emily, if you just want to take a minute to chat about Nassau, and then we'll get to Josh's questions. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so as you saw, this really exciting tool, I think is going um, to do a lot, you know, for, as Josh was saying, practitioners and just anyone looking to advance kind of connectivity projects um, in Suffolk County. And we're really excited. CTAC is undertaking the effort to continue this analysis and prioritization in Nassau County. Um, so again, the main goal is to just assess the condition, size, and suitability for wildlife passage of these culverts and key watersheds um, and to kind of assess um, whether they're in need of replacement and kind of prioritize that. So the field assessment um, is planned to take um, to happen summer and fall of this year, so 2022. And then the prioritization analysis is going to take place in 2023. And then we're hoping to combine those results with the TNCs um, the atlas. So um, we will keep everyone kind of updated on that. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. So we can move on to questions for Josh. Um, I did see one in the chat and then we can open it up um, to our the rest of our audience if you guys want to unmute or ask questions. Um, but Josh, Anthony Allen asks um, if you know where the evacuation route layers came from. You showed us that in one of the slides um, where that data comes from. I believe it's available on the New York State Clearinghouse. Um, so I, I wasn't uh, directly involved with putting the, some of those additional layers into this tool, um, but I know that for um, other areas of the state, that can be found found on the clearinghouse, and I would I would imagine that it's the same for Long Island. Great. All right. Do we have any other questions for Josh? Please feel free to come off mute. Uh, I have a question. Great. I mean, it's a fantastic uh, amount of data went into this project, um, but uh, some of the uh, slides talked about, say, in, for example, culvert sizing, that is more very site specific. So that's, I take it, not included in the uh, uh, in the data that's presented, and that has that engineering has to be done. Uh, by whoever in order to figure out uh, how big that culvert should be and how important it is to the site, uh, for example, transportation of emergency services and fire trucks, um, uh, evacuation. Uh, and also, did you measure the tidal flow on, on all these culverts? that's another thing that we're concerned about. 
Yep. So, so generally, um, I'll answer the questions in reverse, I guess. Uh, so the title question, um, generally those were done during low tide. Um, so, so the directional flow is generally, I believe it's during slack tide. So um, you, you generally measure that um, at, at low tide, low slack tide. Um, and then you look at sort of the water marks or structure marks or any sort of identification of where high tide is or where spring tide is. Um, and sort of that's how you get to to some of the, those answers about getting the, that tide mark and where how high it gets up on the structure. Um, and to answer the, the other question, um, we sort of, we don't, this tool isn't meant to be for like full design of a crossing. So we sort of answered that question in reverse and we look at the restriction. Um, so not necessarily the, the flow volume that would be needed or the, the size of the structure that would be needed. We look at the, the volumes that are there. So we consider how far, how full or size of bank full um, is generally how we identify roughly the, the amount of volume of water. Um, and then we look at the constriction. So how does that compare to what the size of the crossing is? If it's a severe constriction, uh, if it's a moderate or, or minor or no constriction at all. Um, and then looking at the, if it's a, a pipe or box culvert, um, it can actually go into the culvert capacity tool. So looking at the, it, that takes sort of the watershed volume into, into account. Uh, so using that tool, you can click on a, cul on a culvert. It'll draw the, it'll basically draw the watershed and do the, the volume calculation through that. And then it'll give you a volume that has to pass through the crossing. And then looking at the crossing size, it sort of gives you that, um, what storm event would, would it take to overtop the crossing and then overtop the road. So that all factored into the, the tool. Okay, thank you. Well, one of the things we were doing was we were asking uh, marine sciences up at the uh, uh, university to uh, help us do a study. Um, so I guess they would benefit from using this tool. Yeah, feel, it's available. Uh, the link is in the presentation if you need it. I think uh, Natalie put it in the chat as well. Um, yes. But uh, feel free to share it with whoever you think might be might need to use it or feel free to, to link them with us uh, if they want to talk more. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for Josh or for Emily? Yeah, Natalie, this, this is Mike Bettini. Um, Absolutely, I'll go ahead. If um, how it how this has been received by the uh, various highway departments that would probably be involved in in the project, and um, are there any examples of, of of this actually getting utilized to rearrange a uh, stream crossing setup? Let me take that one, Natalie. Yeah, sure, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so what we did with with municipalities. Um, just in general, uh, they, they don't miss, we don't always want to just say that you need to use a mapper or an online tool if, if that's not something that they're generally um, privy to or that they would typically do. So we, we ended up developing top 10 lists uh, for each municipality, which just gives gives them the link to basically that PDF. Um, there's there's a one page sort of breakdown and why it's important, uh, why why what the what the tool will help and sort of what the prioritization is. And then there's a link of 10 crossings um, that are there that are the top identified crossings in their municipality uh, that they can just have that list and open those PDF um, and have it available. Um, and the, what was the, the second question? Oh, your second question was, if, um, has any of the municipalities used the tool yet? Is that, is that right? Yeah. Um, so we actually have had two municipalities that have reached out to us uh, that, that have started to use the tool um, or at least called out the tool in a funding application. Uh, so they looked at that the crossing pulled some information from that from the tool itself um, and then are either have submitted or are planning on submitting for funding um, in the near future. Great. Yeah, this, this is uh, a lot of work, but um, it's a really important part of the puzzle on Long Island uh, for us doing wildlife work particularly. So thank you. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, any other questions from the group that we can answer? Right, I don't see anybody coming off mute. Um, just before we end, I do want to um, bring to your attention, we're gonna send around all of the, the slides and the presentations um, 
but uh, Josh and some of the folks were able to put together these few slides at the end that outline funding opportunities at different levels. Um, so, you know, we wanted to be able to provide that, not necessarily go through each one, but just wanted to call your attention to that when you get the slides, if it's of interest, um, you know, feel free to take a look at that. Um, I will make sure to get out the slides and the recordings, um, hopefully tomorrow, but if not, I early next week. Um, but, you know, in the meantime, I have put all of the links into the chat. I have um, put the contact information into the chat. If you have any questions in the meantime, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we are so thankful first to Emily and Josh for, for going through all this and sharing all the information today, um, but also thankful for all of you for joining us. Um, so like Josh said, please, you know, feel free to send out any of the links or tools to folks that you think might find it helpful that might be able to use it. Um, that's really our, our goal with this is making sure that anybody that needs access to this information has it. Um, so yeah, again, thank you so much. Um, enjoy the beautiful weather on, on Long Island if you're on Long Island today. Um, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Emily and Josh. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks so much, Natalie. Thanks, everyone, for attending. All right. Have a great day, folks. Thank you.